Okay, let's get ready to roll here today and uh, see if we can take on another session here. So praise God, let's have a word of prayer as we start. Thank you, Lord, for this time together today. Thank you, Lord, that we can continue to look to you, our help, our strength, our refuge, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that you continue to just open your word to us. I pray, Father, that we can take and just always keep our eyes upon you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that we can just take and gather here today. Amen. Okay, well, we're going to get started here. I want to throw out something just to, just to clarify something. Last week, I talked a little bit about giving some of the kind of history of where stuff has come from and some of the teachings and stuff. And I mentioned a guy by the name of C.I. Schofield, and I just want everybody to know I don't agree with everything C.I. Schofield did. I mean, the guy was an interesting guy. He actually moved to Atchison, Kansas in his younger years, in his 20s, and he was, uh, he was elected twice to the Kansas House of Representatives when the state first came into being. So that's who he was. And then he was assigned to be U.S. Attorney for the area also. And he was the youngest U.S. Attorney ever at that time at 29 years old. And then he got converted and did some things, but, you know, his dispensations of how things happened, I don't agree with. I don't agree with him on that. I don't agree with his way he approaches the book of Revelation on the seven churches. I don't agree with Mr. Schofield on that. And uh, he just, I just don't think that that is listed there. If it doesn't say it there, you know, don't do that. I mean, I, I don't agree particularly with what he has to say about the sealing of the of the people from the 12 tribes of Israel, and he calls them Jewish evangelists, but it doesn't say that. And so, so C.I. Schoolfield, I mentioned him, but I do not agree and condone some of the things that he said there for sure. So let's just clarify that, that he, I don't put him up there as somebody to, you know, to really say, okay, let's focus on his work. I don't do that. Don't do that. Okay, this morning here, it's kind of an interesting map here. There is Israel right there. And so it's like, man, you got all these Arab countries surrounded them, guys. And it's like, and nobody will take anybody in on that and take them in as refugees. And so it's just crazy. You know, why do they just want that little sliver there? So always be thinking about that a little bit, too. Some things I've run across here. I thought this was kind of interesting right here. Uh, look at these soldiers right here. Look like a pretty pretty tough bunch there to me so but just look at this right here oh, come on. well maybe well anyhow these are all ladies they take their hats off and their hair just flops down there and everything so that's pretty cool so. <laughs> And just to kind of get a flair of kind of where we are as a nation and stuff, too, I thought it would be interesting to watch this little short two-minute clip here. Maybe, if I can get my act together here. And so this is a guy who's, the, who's been leading Messianic congregations in Israel. I want to speak to you about the word veritas. There you go. And uh, it has to do with Harvard College. It has to be the, um, the slogan on the shield of Harvard College. Harvard College was founded in 1636 by a group of Christian ministers, devout Christian ministers. One of them was John Harvard. Another one was a man named Increase Mather. Another one, Henry Dunster. And they formed this college and it was only to train evangelists and pastors and ministers of the gospel early in the, in the late in the 17th century. Uh, now, later on the college grew into becoming a university of different colleges and the other department colleges were not just teaching uh, the Bible, but they were teaching uh, higher academics within a framework, a worldview of Judeo-Christian values. And I'm actually a Harvard graduate. I graduated there from 19, in 1974, and here is my Harvard degree. And you can see on it here is the little, uh, the slogan, the emblem, which it says Veritas. Veritas means truth. and. Uh, it's interesting, there was a young philosophy student in Harvard, that's when I began my search for the truth. 
and ended me up finding out that truth to be in Yeshua. But um, uh, the full slogan of the emblem of Harvard College, that's actually an abbreviation, the full original slogan was Veritas Christos Ecclesia, the truth of Christ and the church. Amazingly enough, this was a totally uh, Christian devout school when it was started. It's kind of ironic or, or frustrating that today, the Ivy League schools have become the schools that are actually promoting values that are destroying a Judeo-Christian worldview, which is the exact opposite of what the original mandate of the school was, was all about. Anyway, uh, I've written a small article about that. I want you to read it. But I want to be, uh, you to be aware of the fact that how the, the world has changed over this time, uh, that these institutions were dedicated to positive values have changed into a really uh, aggressive anti-Judeo-Christian uh, uh, worldview. So I want you to know about that and pray about it. Thank you. Well, did you know that about Harvard? It's kind of interesting. And just to kind of see what's happening here, you know, and the way things have gone downhill, and that's where some of the biggest protests are against Israel and for Hamas is at Harvard. There's at least 25 organizations involved with Harvard there that have been doing that. So I just, uh, you know, that is just, that is really sad considering the way that the things have, have developed there. I was woken up in the middle of the night on, well, not woken, I don't know what, <laughs> I waked up, I woke, <laughs> whatever it is, on Wednesday night, and this scripture was on my mind. And so I just want to share that with you guys since, since we're in the time of the Christmas season here. And this is Simeon who had come into the temple where they had brought Jesus in as a child. And it says, Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold this child, it's destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now, I think that's interesting. I always did, I, I think you need to read it kind of like this too. It's appeared for a sign which will be spoken. Now leave out the parentheses that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. That's really what it's saying there. You know, Jesus is the sign, and he's going to be spoken against, and that will reveal what's in the hearts of many people. And so go meditate on that a little bit. That just stuck out. I mean, I woke up at 3 in the morning, and so I got up and got my Bible out and said, okay, where is that? And so there it was. And so right at this time that we're celebrating this time of the year, too, Another thing that kind of struck me, too, as we get started here. You know, I look at the studies, as I look at this whole thing with Israel, there's three things that I felt like I wanted to accomplish in this class here. To give a historical perspective and see the covenants and stuff that God laid out in the beginning with mankind. And so we saw that. We saw those different things that we saw there. And to see, you know, how does the church of Jesus Christ fit in with the covenant promises of God? So we saw that a little bit there too, and we're going to see that some more today. And then the third thing that's coming up yet is how does all this fit together for God's plan when He will come back and rule the earth and take charge and rule everything? And we're going to be involved if we're as believers. And so we're going to look at that part too in a couple of weeks on that. But that's what I'm witness to see, you know, what did God say, how do we fit in, and what's it look like in the future? And you know, and this is, this is a great verse right up here on the screen, 1 John 3, 2. It says, Beloved, now we are children of God, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in himself purifies himself just as he is pure. And so what's that saying is this. We are the children of God right now, for sure, for sure. But there's still something to come yet. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, Jesus. Now what's the first verse of Revelation 1.1? The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him. 
Now that's interesting. So Jesus is the one that's being revealed in the book of Revelation. That's what's to come. The revealing of Jesus and who he is. And that's what I think is talking about here. We know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And the effect of that is this. And everyone who has this hope in himself purifies himself just as he is pure. So the fact that we want to see Jesus and be with him, the anticipation of that, and that word hope here is anticipation here, the anticipation of that should stir something inside of us to purge us of anything that's not of God. Purifies himself, causes us to take and say, okay, you know, I don't like this attitude that I have, or something, just throwing that out there. I don't like an attitude that I have in me, and that needs to be purged out, purged out and be purified. So to me, that's one of the reasons why we too, we look ahead to see what God is going to do in the future. And then we say, okay, if we really are serious about this, it's going to affect how we live now, right now in this time here. So something to think about, just throwing that out there and doing that like that. Let's go a little bit into our study here for today, and let's kind of just take and start out here with this verse right here. Now what I want to do here, in the midst of all this stuff when we talk about Israel, we definitely have to be mindful of what God said about them and his displeasure of them, his displeasure of them. And one of the, one of the verses I was made aware of, and so I went and looked this up and studied it here, and this talks about some of the things that God was displeased about at this time in the book of Jeremiah, the 24th chapter. And so you can go read this on your own. Look at it and see what it says. But he talks about figs that are good figs and figs that are very bad figs. And he refers to those people that made good decisions and bad decisions. So he talks about that. And he goes into an extensive thing on this about taking and showing that, you know, there was bad involved with the people of Israel at that time. And we know that. We know many places. They failed. Many places. They failed and didn't do what they should have done. Now, what I find interesting, let's pass this around to you. I'm sorry, I should have done that sooner. Everybody would use if you could. So what you study and what you find out on some of this, if you look on the back page of that paper where it says latter times on that, and look at that. Down towards the center of it there, you'll see a passage out of the book of, of Jeremiah there in the 23rd chapter. And what we see here going on here is, yes, he tells them of all their faults. He tells them all the bad stuff that's going on, the stuff you need to repent of. You know, you've done evil in the sight of the Lord. You've done bad. It's been bad. But then he comes on and has some interesting passages here. If you'll notice this in the middle of the page, and I call this latter days, because in the Old Testament, there's this phrase there called the latter days, and it says, this is what's going to happen in the latter days. So when you see the word latter days, I say at least 75% of the time, at least, he is talking about the end of the age. The end of the age before he comes back, before the Lord returns. And if you really look at these things, in the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy, go read those passages on your own sometime. You've got Moses prophesying here to the tribes of Israel. He's telling them, you know, what's going to befall you? What's going to happen to you? And so we see that there, and it comes across into the book of Isaiah. You'll see it there. And then you come into Jeremiah, and there's four passages in the book of Jeremiah that talk about the latter days. And each one of those passages, if you go and read it, and Jeremiah is a hard book to read. I would suggest you read it in a modern translation like English Standard Version or something like that. Even New King James, you know, kind of just like, what is the, where is going on here? But something like that works good. But all of these passages here give what a positive thing that the God was going to do with the hearts of his people and turn them back to him after he rails on them for four or five chapters before that of saying, okay, you guys are just missing it. You're missing it. 
And then he tells them, I'm going to do something with you in the latter days. So go read those passages there and that. And read the chapters before these. Now, especially that second one there, Jeremiah 30. He spends five chapters here coming and saying, you guys are just messed up totally. And then he says, and then he says in Jeremiah 30, verse 24, the fierce anger of the Lord will not return until he has done it, until he has performed the, the intents of his heart. In the latter days you will consider this. And if you go back and look at that, it's saying, I'm going to do something to turn your heart around and bring you back to me. That's what he's saying there. So go back and read all these things here, especially in the book of Daniel too, uh, how it gives that. And notice the one that's really interesting. The one in Isaiah, Isaiah 2.2, 2, kind of at the top one-third of the page there. Now shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Now that is amazing. Now go to the very last one on that page, Micah 4.1. This is what it says. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it. Now it's almost verbatim from what it was in the book of Isaiah. So he's saying, I want to confirm to you that I'm going to do something in this last time period that's going to cause people to flow to the mountain of the Lord. Is what he's saying. And the mountain of the Lord being Jerusalem. And so the whole Bible is basically revolves, revolves around the Jews and the land in the Middle East there. You won't see much mentioned up in Europe, in the lands in Europe. For sure, the United States, I don't think there's anything mentioned there. At least that I can see, at least. There might be something you could infer to, maybe. But there is so much going on in that area of the Middle East there that God's really focused on that. So, that's why I look at it, too. And so you get the bad that we see here in Jeremiah, and then you see this thing about the latter days that I just handed out to you, that he says, okay, I'm going to do with it like that. And then you see some other interesting things coming up in the Old <coughs> Testament. Before we get to where we're going here, I want to mention this. The book of Ezekiel is an amazing book. The book of Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, he spends time talking about dry bones that are dead. They don't have any flesh on them. Nothing's going on there. They look worthless. They're just laying in a valley. Just nothing's happening. And he says, I'm going to put life to those bones. I'm going to put flesh on them. And then he ends up saying there in Ezekiel 37, and, the, and Ezekiel asks him, who are these? And he said, it's the whole house of Israel. That's what he says. And so he comes along in Ezekiel 39, and he's talking then about some, some areas there and some things there. So look what it says in verse 1 of Ezekiel 39. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog, and thus, say, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, Tubal. And so he's talking about that, and he's going to give an extensive thing of what's going to happen with that. And so what I find interesting is you get in the book of Revelation, and the 20th chapter, see what it says here. It talks about Satan. When the thousand years have expired of millennium, Satan will be released from the prison. He will go out to deceive the nations, which are in four cords there, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is the sand of the sea. So he's talking here. Ezekiel saw this back then. John picks up on this in Revelation and says, yeah, this is what Ezekiel's talking about. Well, not only did Ezekiel seek that also, what he saw is this in the 48th chapter. Now chapters 40 through 48 in Ezekiel talk about measuring a temple. That's what he's talking about. And he goes into detail of measuring the temple. And so he says here, here are the gates. There's a gate of Simeon, Issachar, Zebulun. He goes and describes all the 12 tribes there in this here, talking about this temple that he had a vision of that God was showing him. Well, then you come over here in the book of Revelation again. And it says this in 21.12. And here, John is describing the temple also. He's describing a very similar thing. It says, it says, He carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, 
and her life was likened to a stone most precious, even like a jasper, clear as crystal. And it had a great and high, and it had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates. At the twelve gates, twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. So here, Ezekiel sees this clear back here in his book here describes to me, which is very similar, the dimensions don't quite line up, but the fact that he saw a glorious temple in the book of Ezekiel, and here John comes along in Revelation, and in both places it involved sons of Israel. He calls them out by tribe name in Ezekiel, and here it says here that this temple had the gates and the twelve tribes of the children of Israel on those gates. Now the thing that's interesting too, it says it also goes down, the foundations were the 12 apostles. So the gates are the 12 tribes of Israel, the foundations, the apostles, and the apostles are going to be ruling over the 12 tribes. He goes on to say that down later. So what I'm trying to do with this is say, yes, there's still a connection from Israel in the Old Testament, no matter how evil they were, which they were. I mean, it, things got really bad. Especially, you know, when after the time of Solomon, when the kingdom split into two, two parts. You had the northern kingdom, which was called Israel at that time. And it continued on like that as a divided nation until the time of Jesus. Then they came together and they called it one Israel. But whenever you see Israel from the time of Solomon on, it was talking about the wicked kingdom of the north. The south was the good one. Jer uh, Judah and Benjamin, they were the good one. So, but what I'm saying is here, you got this carrying forward from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Now, let's keep going on just a little bit more on this. So, that's the same one. I got it twice. I don't need that twice. Okay. So, what I'd like to do is to kind of lay out something here that Paul lays out here. And he's going to say something interesting here. Because when you come into the New Testament, you're going to get a glimpse of saying, okay, you see this Israel in the past. How does the church connect with that now? So let's read what he says in Ephesians 2. Therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision, made with flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Now get that. He said beforehand, you were strangers to the covenants of promise made to Israel, having no hope, hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made both one. Who's both? Who's both? The believers who are Jews and the believers who are Gentiles. Both one. Broken down the middle wall of separation, have abolished in his flesh the enmity that is in the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to make, create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. So one new man is what he's talking about. One new man is what he's looking for. And so this is, but the connection here is interesting. He says, you were strangers to the covenants of promise. So now the promises made to them back there in the old time, especially the promises of being a blessing, especially that, because he said he would bless Abraham. And so there's a blessing that flows from that covenant from Abraham to us. That's what I think it's saying here. So go home and meditate on that. And so we see that in the book of Ephesians then that Paul lays that out. Now, when we get to see what I spoke to you about a little bit last week is when there's some people that says the church has totally replaced the nation of Israel and everything, period. Everything's done with Israel. And they usually point to two passages of Scripture, and I'm going to give you those two passages of Scripture, and the first one's up on the screen. And so here, when Stephen is given his, his uh, spiel before all the people there, just before they stone him, this is what he says. And he talked about, he said, this is Moses the prophet who sent the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, him you shall hear. 
Now that's interesting. Uh, just stop it at that. The Lord will raise up a prophet like me. That's Moses talking. Do you ever consider Moses to be a prophet? I mean, that's what it says here. He's a prophet. Moses was a prophet. And that's why you can go back to Deuteronomy, especially the 30th chapter. You go back to, you know, those passages. There's a passage in the book of Numbers that it lists there too on your sheet. Go back and read those. And you can see that Moses is prophesying what lies ahead for the people. So Stephen said, yeah, that's who he was. He was a prophet. This is the one, this is he, who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us. So what he is saying here, the congregation in the wilderness, some translations put that, the church in the wilderness, and referring back to their wandering in the wilderness that they had at Mount Sinai. Now, if you go back and you look at the Greek New, a Greek Old Testament called the Septuagint. This word is ekklesia right here. This word in the Greek is ekklesia. If you go back into the Old Testament and look what it says there about that congregation and those involved, it's the same exact Greek word. It is. A hundred times in the Old Testament. A hundred times that occurs there in the Old Testament in the Greek version of it. So, yes, there is a connection there. There is a connection, I'll acknowledge that, because he's talking about that right here. But it doesn't say that, you know, totally these guys are gone and not for anything. I don't think it's saying that. Now the other passages, the other passages that's used is this one. And so in Galatians 6, 14, it says, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me, nigh to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but a new creation. And that's what he's getting. The new man, the new creation, just like we saw in Ephesians chapter 2. And notice what it says in verse 16. And as many as walk according to this rule, Peace, be, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. So who's he talking about here, the Israel of God? Who is that? And so these people will say, okay, here he's talking about the church is now the Israel of God. I don't think so, but go home and meditate on it. Go home and meditate on it. I just don't think that's what he's saying here. I think he's just saying, you know, that, hey, you know, you know, he's wanting to make one new man, a new creation, a new creation. That's definitely what he's saying. Nothing is important but a new creation, a new creation. Okay, anybody got any comments on any of this you want to put out? Now's your time. Okay? Okay. Now, what I want to do, okay, so those are the two instances where that most people, and believe me, I know what I'm talking about because I sat under a guy's teaching for two years that said this. And, and talking with some other people, we didn't agree with it. I mean, he had lots of good stuff. In fact, the guy, he was a great Christian guy. I just love him. And, you know, he was, uh, I went down and sat in Bible classes in Wichita a couple of years down there. And the guy was just, he was just amazing. He, had, he gave his whole life to studying the Bible. And he was the official Bible teacher down there at this place in Wichita. And it turned out here a couple years ago that that he had decided he was not going to do this anymore. And he said, I'll give you everything I ever did in my life. So he gave me a flash drive, and I have his whole life work on a flash drive. And I still go back and look at it, because he had some good stuff. I just didn't agree with him on this. So we can agree to disagree is what I'm saying. <laughs> so Now, let's look and see. Let's go to the book of Romans here now. We're going to spend the rest of the time in the book of Romans. The book of Romans consists of 16 chapters. 16 chapters in the book of Romans. And it's like, you know, it's just a, it's just a great thesis. I had, I had one guy say, you know, this is laid out like a lawyer would present in a legal argument. That's what a lot of people refer to Romans as. He's laying it out as a, as a, as a way to defend the faith and to say, yes, this is what this is all about, what I'm preaching to you. Because you've got to realize, this message was radical back then. It was radical. And so people were being, you know, Paul, you know, himself was out. He was on his way to go and get some more Christians, round them up, throw them into jail when he got knocked off of that horse on the Damascus Road. 
And so this was really radical. So he had to lay it out here as to what was happening both to Jew and to Gentile. Now, you know, Paul was, Paul went to preach, you know, most of the time he says, you know, he went to the synagogue first to preach, and then they kicked him out, and he said, lo, I go to the Gentiles. I'll get, get to where somebody will listen to me. So they kick him out of synagogues. He would go out there and he'd preach the Gentiles then. But he lays out three chapters here in the book of Romans, 9, 10, and 11, where he takes and he says, this is what is going on with the people who are Jewish that I'm trying to preach to. So this is what he's saying. So basically what he does in 9, chapter 9, he kind of lays out a history of what happened to the Jews. 10, he kind of lays out what it is at his present time that he was talking to them about. And 11, he lays it out of what's ahead. And so he, he's pretty clear about this. So let's look at it. So in 9.1, he says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have a great heaviness, continual sorrow in my heart, for I wish that myself could even be accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom also concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever. Amen. So, list all, you see all the things here that God promised to Israel in the beginning. To what he promised to Abram, he comes down through Isaac, through Jacob. In fact, you know, I mean, Jesus makes it very clear. If you go to John chapter 4, and when he's we're talking with the woman in the well around the 22nd verse or so, somewhere around there, He's talking with her, and they talk about, you know, well, where we should go and worship, you know. Is it up here where you guys in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem or down here? And Jesus said, the hour is coming, and now it is, where they that worship God shall worship him in spirit and in truth. And then they have a little more discussion there, and then he says to the woman, he says, you know not what you worship, for salvation is of the Jews. That is out of the mouth of Jesus. Salvation comes from the Jews, period. Jesus said it, I believe what Jesus said. So, the importance of the Jewish people for now, I mean, we've got to be thankful for them, because it, what we have is from them. And so that's why I just get, I just, it just sorrows my heart when you see these people speaking against the Jews and stuff. Yeah, we're going to see what's going on with it. I'll bring you into the 11th chapter, and we'll see what's going on with them now. And see what God's going to do. But this was Paul's attitude. You know, this is where this stuff comes from. The glory, the adoption. We're adopted into the kingdom. The covenants, the giving of the law, service of God, and the promises. So yes, that's where this all comes from. So, and then he does go on. He says this. Not as though the word of God had taken an effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel neither because they are the seed of Abraham or they children, but in Isaac shall your seed be called. Why Isaac? Because he was the child of promise, the promise. And so, and so that is they which are of the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted for the seed. So this is what he said. You Jews, you're from the seed. You're from the seed. You can trace back to you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because you can do that, that doesn't make you, that doesn't make you in covenant with God right now. It doesn't do it. Now, it doesn't mean that they're yucky and they'll never can be saved or anything like that. It doesn't mean that. How many of you think you would agree with this? Raise your hand. They are children. I mean, we're the children of God. They are not unless they believe. And so it's pretty clear here. The children of the flesh are not the children of God, it says. That's what it says. Children of the flesh are not the children of God. So he come along here and he talks about he talks about when Isaac is born, he talks about that. He talks about Jacob. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. The elder shall serve the younger. So that dynamic was going on, just like I said last week. You got the things of Esau going on right now, which are basically in the area of Syria. And you've got, you know, all sorts of dynamics run through there right now. I should point out to you one thing. If you want to see a dynamic, 
Uh, go to this, uh, on your sheet there. Oh, I know it's there, just a minute. Okay, Jeremiah 49.39, about two-thirds of the way down on your sheet. Jeremiah 49.39. It says, I shall, It shall come to pass in the latter days, I will bring back the captives of Elam, says the Lord. E-L-A-M. E-L-A-M. Now, a better translation of that is, I will restore the fortunes of Elam. Who is Elam? Elam is the lower area of Iran around the Kushtan province in the area of Kuwait. And he said, in the last days, I'm going to restore your fortunes. That's the most oil-rich territory in the world right there. And God said he was going to do something. So you got that dynamic going on too now. So you got stuff going on now of other things. you got promises made there that are in that same area of the country going on. God's moving. He's doing things. And that there is one of the most amazing passages right there. Go get you an old map and, and look up Elam on it. And you'll see it down there in the lower part of where Iran is now. So, you got the dynamic of Esau working up in Syria. You got things, God restoring fortunes down here, even, even to the guys who don't like us and doing stuff there. And so basically, he just saying, I'm just going to take and do my word, is what I'm going to do. Now, I want to get to where we're going here, so let's go here. So, he goes into chapter 10, he lays it out in chapter 9 that they're people of the covenant. Now, the first verse of chapter 10, next chapter over, he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. And so he's stating specifically here, they are not going to go to heaven unless they come to Jesus. Period. That's what Paul's saying right there. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to the knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. And so he's saying here that they're trying to do their own thing and to get to God without going through Jesus. That's basically what he's saying right here. And so you can go on and see that, and you can see what he's saying there. Uh, there's so much quote from the Old Testament. Go back and, and whenever you see it in italics like you see it on the screen right here, when you see it on italics, you know it's a quote from the Old Testament, especially if it's in New King James, where we're reading it. And go read this part. This is really interesting here. Uh, I just, you know, we could spend a day on this right here, on this passage from the Old Testament. But it, the, the thing that he sums it up with, the word, of, the word is near you in your heart, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That is directly from the Old Testament, that quote there, directly. And if you commit, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God's raised you from the dead, you'll be saved from the mark. With the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. <coughs> and so he goes on, he quotes some more Old Testament in there. And so faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Quotes some more Old Testament. Quotes Moses here. I will, now this is an interesting one. He talks about Israel rejecting, but Moses says, listen to this, I will provoke you to jealousy. He's talking about Israel. Get what it says. I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation, and I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. And then he says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. And again, a quote from the Old Testament. Notice what he says here in the 19th verse. I will provoke you to jealousy. And guys, I can tell you that is happening over in Israel. I'm telling you, there is Christians over there serving in the IDF. This one guy I just listened to yesterday has something on every day. And he's a soldier in the IDF. And I don't know how they let him do this, but he is there on site in the battle places recording a YouTube thing for TBN uh, TV. And he records that. And he talks about, you know, yes, we're witnessing to these soldiers because, hey, you never know who's going to die. And these people are concerned about dying. I mean, there's been, there's probably been at least four to ten people a day dying over there from the IDF. And so these people 
are being provoked to listen to these people because they're in dire straits. I mean, they could be going tomorrow, and they realize that. So there's a jealousy that's taking place there. Okay, now let's go to the 11th chapter. And let's see what he says here. So again, remember what we're doing. 9, he's kind of given the history of stuff. 10 is where they're currently at. They've got to repent. They've got to come to Jesus. And now in chapter 11, he says this. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Now notice how some of these other translations translate that verse. I ask then, New International Version, I ask then, did God reject his people? Has God rejected his people? You know, has he cast them away? Has he said, you know, I don't have any use for you anymore? And you can go down and read all those different ways it's translated. And you can see here that he is saying here, you know, no, I have not cast them away. Did he cast away his people whom he foreknow, or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? So now he goes back to Elijah when he was there and with the, um, the whole thing with Balaam and all of that stuff that went on there. And he says, and he says there in verse 3, Lord, they have killed your prophets, torn down your altars, I alone have left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so, at this present time, there is a remnant. A remnant of who? A remnant of Israel, according to the election of grace. Now, I don't want to get into that, but, you know, that's election of grace. Okay, just go home and think about it. <laughs> and so he talks about grace then. And then it says, what then? What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have attained it. Who's the elect? That's us. That's us believers. That's the way I see it. So the elect have attained what they could have had. I think that's what he's saying. And then the rest were blinded. So he says, okay now, so what's this blindness thing about here? Just as it is written. So he pulls this out from the Old Testament too. And I don't have time to go into all those where they came from, but you can go search them out. God has given them a, a spirit of stupor eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear, to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. And let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow back and bow down their back always. In other words, they're stiff necked and they won't listen. So, he's saying all this stuff about them, that they're blinded, they're taken, they won't listen, they can't see what's going on, they can't grasp what I'm trying to tell them. And then he comes to verse 11, he says this, but have they stumbled so that they should fall? Now, if you look at that word fall and see where it goes, it means like completely fallen away and can't be brought back. That's the idea of it. And you can go and trace this word out in other places. We're not going to do that now. But he says, certainly not but through their fall to provoke them to jealousy again, salvation has come to the Gentiles. They try to be provoked with jealousy. So eventually they'll become jealous of what we as believers have. That's what he said. Now twice he said that. Twice he said that about jealousy. And so now if their fall, now this is interesting now what he's saying. So if their fall, referring to Israel, is riches for the world, which, what, which is what it was, because now we have what they should have had. That's what he's saying. It's the riches we have now. He says, then their and their failure, riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So, okay, so what is he saying there? And so he says, I speak to the Gentiles, we're going to get to it. In so much as I am apostle of Gentiles, I magnify men's ministry, if by any means I might provoke to jealousy those who are of my flesh, my kinspeople, and save some of them. Three times jealousy now. Jealousy, jealousy. They're jealous of what we got. Because they should have had it. For if they're... You know, look at it here. For if their casting away is the reconciling of the world, what would their acceptance be but life from the dead? And so he's saying they're cast away here right now. 
But if they accept and come, it's going to be like life from the dead. And then he goes into this. So he's going to give us a little, a little sermon here about an olive tree. So what he's going to talk about here is an olive tree. And it will get to him. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And so he's going to tell us who this root is about in here in just a little bit. So he's saying here that it's holy. And then he goes and he says, if some of the branches were broken off. Now who's he talking about? Broken off. Who got broken off? Israel. They're broken off. They're broken off from the tree. They're broken off from it. And you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Do not boast against those branches broken off. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. So the branches that are broken off the olive tree, the Israel people, because they stumbled and disbelieved and wouldn't believe what God had for them, gave us the opportunity to be grafted in and partake of them. But he says, you remember, you got, you're connected to the root. You're connected to the root. And so now he's going to go on and say a little bit more. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, he says. Because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Now that's a hard verse. If God didn't spare them and allow them to be broken off, what makes you think he might not do the same with you? And then he says, therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fell, the branches broken off severity, and towards you goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. That's a good one to go meditate on. So, and they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted back in, for God is able to do it. For, and then this is really interesting, because this goes, this is a really good uh, thing about a teaching of grafting. If you've ever been involved grafting branches on trees and stuff like that, this is interesting because it says here, for if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, were grafted in contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? So we came in against nature. He stuck us in there in the midst of his purposes and that he shows in this tree here. And he says, you're here now. So, and then he comes up with the clincher right here. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So what's that about? He's saying here then, he's saying that there's coming a time that the blinders will be lifted off. The blinders will be lifted off. And when is that? When the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, if you want to read some, go look at that fullness or the, the full measure of the Gentiles. Jesus talked about that, too. He talked about it in, in uh, Luke 17, I think it was, somewhere around there. But go look at what he has to say about this very same thing here, about the Gentiles. And then he says in 16, And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion, turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. And then he throws this verse in here that we often quote out of context. The context of this verse, this next verse, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. They can't be taken back. Now a lot of times we don't read it in the context. The context is that he has a calling for Israel, and he ain't going to take it back. That's what he's saying right there. That's what it looks to me like. For as once you were disobedient to God, you have now obtained mercy through their disobedience. Even so, they're also, they, even so these also have now been disobedient, but through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. Over the depth and the riches of the mercy of God, and the wisdom of God, and on search for his judgments, ways of past finding out. For who has, who has known the mind of the Lord, who has become his counselor? Again, Old Testament. Or who was first given to him that should be repaid? Go read about that. For of him, 
Through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. So, go back and read that a little bit and study that a little bit. That's why I say, you know, I can see what the prophet Ezekiel is talking about. He names those people from the tribes of Israel, and here they show up in the book of Revelation. And you can see this here. He says, yeah, these guys are blinded, they're messed up, but there's coming a time when that's going to change. And so, I don't, that's a pretty bold statement. He says, look at what it says right there. All Israel will be saved. Now, I don't know how that's going to look like. I don't know what it's going to look like. But he says that, and it's, and it's again, it's got to be through the deliverer. The deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away in godliness from Jacob. How's that going to look? I don't know, but that's what it says. So, you know, that's what it says. Okay. Next week, now, and I would encourage people to do this. If you've got something you don't agree with here, send me the scriptures and we'll talk about it. I'm serious. I'm totally serious. And, you know, we may even have the last session to where we just say, okay, if you want to come back for one more session, let's talk about some of this. You put the questions down, you give me the stuff, and I'll believe me, I'll talk about them. Because, you know, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe I am. I do not. I mean, I take this thing seriously. You know what James chapter 3, verse 1 says? It says this, Brethren, not many of you be teachers on whom shall be a stricter judgment. Now, I take that very seriously because we all got to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. If you're a teacher, you've got a stricter judgment. And you're going to be looked at a lot more with scrutiny than what somebody's not a teacher is. So I take that very seriously. So if, I, if I'm missing something, I want you guys to, let's talk about it, okay? I know I'll go kind of fast here, but we'll keep, uh, next week we're going to look a little bit more at what, at what the, uh, we're going to look a little bit more at what the, how the church fits into stuff too and what the church's destiny is. Then we'll get into the thing about what's God's end goal. God's end goal is this. He's going to come back a second time. He's going to rule the earth. And if you're saved and born again, you're going to be a part of it. And we're going to look at that. Because to me, that's what keeps me going. Because I know this life is short. And I know there's more coming. And I want to be a part of it. And I want to be one of those that says, hey, you know, come join us and help. Let's, let's do this. Let's take this on. So we're going to look next time about, you know, the pressure that's going to come Israel to Israel that I think is going to help turn them back to the Lord too. Okay? You guys are all just looking at me. <laughs> let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you, Lord, for, for taking and just continues to reveal your word to us. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. And, Lord, that we can just be those that partake of the promises that are out there. And we know that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. So, Lord, we love you. Thank you for the rest of the service today. Blessings on your people here. Amen. amen.